Take your Bible now, if you will, please, and turn to the book of Colossians, chapter 3. The book of Colossians, chapter 3, and the book of Revelation, chapter 20. Now, we're bringing a series of messages on heaven. We're thinking about this thought. How can I enjoy heaven if I know my loved ones are in hell? We're trying to set the stage for this and trying to lay a solid foundation before we get into the intricacies of preparing for that place. Let me say this before I go any further. Do you realize, are you listening? Do you realize that in the next moment, your world could change drastically? In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. The rapture could take place and every Man, woman, boy, or girl in this building would be gone just like that. That'd be it. No more witnessing. No more praying for souls down here. That's it. We're gone to be with him. It can happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And we'll be home. I'm looking forward to that. But there's some things we need to remember before we get there. Now look at Revelation 20. First of all, if you will, please. Revelation 20. Verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to a bottomless pit. Who is that angel? How do you identify him? We'll talk about that later. Having a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more, Till the thousand years should be fulfilled. After that, he must be loosed for a little season. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Who are they? Who are these people that sit on thrones? Who are they that judge? Very interesting to think about who it is. I think we can identify them in the days ahead. They're on thrones. They sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that who hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle the number of whom is of the sand of the sea. And they went upon the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about. And the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat upon it, whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Little footnote. There's going to be a great white throne judgment. They that are judged are sinners that have rejected God. Every sinner that's ever lived or ever will live will stand before God. There's going to be a great white throne there. The judge is Jesus, but there are others there that are judging as well. Who are they? And who do they judge? They judge the dead. If you take part in that, and if I take part in that, think about that. Here's a lost mother, a lost father, a lost brother, a lost sister. They're part of that group that's being judged. 
What will be the thoughts of the people who are judging? Interesting, isn't it? A lot of things that we need to think about. A lot of things about this Bible that we need to really dig into and look at. Now, to set the stage for all of that in the days ahead, look at chapter 3 of the book of Colossians. Look what the Bible says from the, the Apostle Paul in verse 1. If, or sent, ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on the things of the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then ye also will appear with him in glory. Now look at verse 2. Set your affections on things above, not on the things of this earth. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we've read verses today that are not easily interpreted. It takes rightly dividing the word of truth. It takes looking at the whole counsel of God. It takes prayer. It takes being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we want to be that person that will rightly divide the word of truth. We want to be that person that goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And it affects our life to where we look forward to heaven and we know about heaven and some things about it that will want us to live a better life here as we await that holy place. And so, Father, I pray this morning that you will allow us and speak to us and that we will give attention to the Word of God, that we'll not allow Satan to divide our mind and our thinking and to disrupt our thinking toward the Word of God. And so I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will speak to my heart and to our heart about your word this morning and about heaven and hell and the future. This prayer I ask in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. It seems to me and it seems to a lot of folk that I've been talking to lately that we're more interested in where we're going to go to eat than things of heaven. We're more interested about where we're going to go to eat than what does the Bible say about heaven and what does the Bible say about eternity. Now, be honest with me this morning and answer this question in your own mind. Just be honest. In the last week, how many times did you think about heaven? How many times did it go through your mind, today may be the day that I go be with Jesus. Today may, may be the day that I'll hear the trumpet sound and I'll hear that voice that says, come up hither. And in less than one-sixth of a second, Every saved man, every saved woman, boy or girl, their soul and spirit will be united. They'll be taken up into that heavenly place in less than one-sixth of a second and we'll be with Him forever and ever. If it happened right now, every person in this building who are saved was gone. If you're here this morning and you're not saved, you would be left right here. You don't want that to happen. You don't want that to happen. Because the Bible says that after we're gone, that Satan is going to have his day. And the Bible says that they will be sent to those that are left behind, strong delusion, that they will believe a lie, and that they will be damned who did not hold the truth in righteousness. How many times this week did you think about heaven? How many times did this, this week did you think about the rapture of the church. I got to thinking about that last night as I, as I went to bed. And I got to thinking of this, and then I got to praying, Lord, help me to be concerned about leaving this world. Today may be the last day I'll have an opportunity to preach. It might be the last day I'll have an opportunity to witness to somebody. Can I just share something out of my heart with you a moment? And we're this way, we're human beings. You know that I visit on Thursday evening and Saturday morning. And uh, for the, since March, I've been doing that. And the Lord has been able, enabled me to visit people. They have come. We have people here this morning that's been visited by people in our church. I went out yesterday and went to a certain section over in the area where Brother Russ lives. 
Did the same thing that I always do. I parked my car, tried to find a shade tree, parked it under it, and uh, marked off where I left off last Saturday. And I said, I'm going to finish this whole street, and then I'm going to come down this street, and I'll have this whole section done. In my opinion, it was the worst day of visiting I've ever had. Only one person came to the door, and they weren't interested. Now listen to me. All the way up this street, all the way down that street, knocking on doors. And by the time I got back down there, it was warm and hot, and I was sweating. And the one visit I had was from a Christian who goes to one of these newer churches in the area. And uh, the attitude he had was just appalling. When I asked him about heaven and hell and did he know he was saved. The old devil crawled on my shoulder and said, why are you doing this? They don't care. They're not interested. That's the devil. That's the flesh. The devil and the flesh will do everything that it can to keep you from thinking about heaven. And to keep you from thinking about doing the job God has called you to do. God's called me to do what? Sow the seed. So I got in the car and I started thinking, did I obey the Lord this morning? Yes. Did I try to sow the seed? Yes. I left a track on every door that didn't come to the door or on a car. And the more I thought about that, the happier I got because I said, Lord, I did what you told me to do. I did what you told me to do. And I said, Lord, help me to think about eternity. Help me to think about the judgment seat of Christ. Help me to think about the fact that one day we will be rewarded for our faithfulness. And the Lord wants us to be faithful. Now, why should we think about heaven? And why should we preach about heaven and teach about heaven? Why should we set our affections on things above? First of all, because of the false teaching about heaven. Have you listened to the television or the radio or read books and the false teaching that's out there about heaven? It's ludicrous. It's ridiculous, the thoughts that people have about heaven and what it's going to be like and, and hell and all of the other things. And we need people walking up and down the street. We need people standing in the pulpit. We need people set teaching in Sunday school that has a grasp of this book. They understand it. They know how to teach it. They know how to rightly divide it. And they're preaching about heaven and hell and telling people that they need to be prepared. We need to think about heaven not only because of the misconceptions and the false teaching but we also need to think about heaven because of the teaching in the Scripture about heaven. Now look at our text again here in Colossians chapter 3. Watch what the Bible says. <clears throat> since then ye be risen in Christ, or since in Christ is risen, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And then he says, set your affection. The word set is fix. Fix your attention. What was my attention fixed on this week? What was your attention fixed on this week? You say, well, I had to work. I had to drive my car. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. But even doing all of that, you can have a mindset and have your heart fixed that all that you're doing and want to do it is for the glory of God. You can be a witness at work. You can be a witness wherever you are. And so set your affection. Fix your affection on things above. And then he says affection. You know what affection is, don't you? If you love your wife, you show her affection. You want to give her attention. What he's saying is this. Give a attention to the things which are above. Fix, set your affections on things which are above. And then we need to set our affections on heaven because it'll change the way we live down here. If I really believe that in the next moment I could face Jesus, if I really believe that in the next 10 seconds I'd be out of here, it'll change my thinking. It'll change my way of living. Now, turn to Hebrews chapter 12. The book of Hebrews chapter 12. 
You know these verses, and some of you have memorized them, but I want you to see them in the Scripture. And I'm not going to quote it, I'm going to read them. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Wherefore. Now, somebody said, when you see a wherefore in the Bible, find out what the wherefore is there for. Now, if you go back to chapter 11, the writer mentions one man after another, one woman after another that serve God. Somebody has said that this is God's honor roll. Abraham, Isaac. By the way, let me point something out to you. If you read chapter 11, you're going to find one man, one woman named again and again and again and again, and every one of them are different. Every one of them are different. You've got a harlot. You've got Joseph that probably was one of the most godly men that ever walked on this earth. Have you ever thought about Joseph, a young man, probably 23 years of age? He's a slave. He's there not of what he has done, but what somebody else did. His family disowned him, threw him in for dead, sold him as a slave. He's now bought by Potiphar. And by the way, Potiphar, you know who Potiphar is? Potiphar is the head of the king's guard. He is the one that says who gets their head cut off and who doesn't get their head cut off. That's Potiphar. And this young man is working for him. He's such a godly man that this executioner who's in charge of all of Pharaoh's army and the executions promotes this young man. And finally, he says, uh, Joseph, everything I have, you're in charge of. But then you study the story, and every day Potiphar's wife comes to Joseph and says, come have an affair with me, every day. And then you read on, and it says that every single day she came after him. And she got mad, and one day she set the stage and sent all the servants out and she was there with him by herself, and he, the trap had been set. And she said, basically, there's nobody here, nobody will know, come lie with me. You're 23 years old. You know what he did? He ran out. He ran out and left his cloak behind. And because of that, he spent three more years in prison. What would you have said, young man, if that was you? Well, why, why did God do this to me? Not Joseph. But you know what happens? Faithfulness has its rewards. Godliness has its rewards. Did you hear me what I said? Godliness has its awards. And finally, you know the story. He is second in Egypt. Second in Egypt. Can you imagine what Potiphar thought then after he was promoted above him? Are you listening? So here are men and women, and they were victorious. And so now you come to chapter 12, and the writer says, Because of what I have just said, because of these men and these women and their faithfulness and their godliness and their holiness, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Why should I think about heaven? Because it leads to godliness down here. It leads to holiness down here. It leads to the fact that it will prepare us for the judgment seat of Christ. It will prepare us for that day when we look into His face and He looks into our face. Now, I don't know exactly how the judgment seat of Christ is going to be, but if, from what I've studied and looking into the Greek language, I get the picture that even though every saint is going to be judged on that day because He's God and He can do it any way He wants to, it's going to look like I'm the only one that's there, and it's a, the Lord Jesus and me. And I'm going to get, Paul said, you'll give an account for the things that you've done in the body. Then will I hear him say, well done, or will I just be in heaven? You know, Paul says about, talks about that in Corinthians. 
He said, some will be saved yet as though by fire. They're just in heaven, and that is it. Now then, if I want to be ready for heaven, he's given us an idea here. Watch. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. The word weight there, lay aside every difficulty. Lay aside every mass. You see, he's talking about a runner in a race. If you're going to run in a race, you lay aside everything that would hinder you. Everything. Everything. Don't let anything hinder you. That's what he's saying. So, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset. We've got to put these things away. Put these things down so that we can do what? Run without difficulty. Run without a hindrance. Now, if I love Jesus, and I'm really concerned about heaven, I'm going to be prepared for all obstacles. I will want to, as uh, Dr. Erwin Lutcher said, I will want to run to win. Running to win. Why? Because I want to be ready for heaven. Running to win. We have today in our world insincere religion. We have religion without sincerity. I think it was uh, 69. I'm almost certain that it was 69. I'd just come home from work and sat down and the Johnny Carson show was on and they had the Oak Ridge Boys on and I wanted to See what he said. Well, they came on and they sang for that group. You know the Johnny Carson show, the night show with Johnny Carson. Some of you remember that. The Oak Ridge Boys used to be a southern gospel group, if you, you, you that are a little bit older. You know what they sang on that show? I'll Fly Away. That's what they sang. Then they sat down. Now listen to this. Then the Oak Ridge Boys sat down and Carson began to ask them questions. And you know what the leader of the Oak Ridge Boys said? We cut our teeth on that kind of singing. And then, of course, they went from that to honky-tonk. And what they did is they took religious words and put honky-tonk music to it and sing it. Insincere religion. You got it? I don't know about you, but if I serve God, I want to be sincere about it. I want to be sincere. Now, I don't know whether they're saved or not. Now they've come all the way back again, and now they're on television again singing religious songs. I hope they're sincere. I'm not sure. But you see, this matter of insincere religion. Now, I want you to listen to me this morning. Next week you'll hear another speaker, but after that we're going to get down to the nitty-gritty of this subject that we're laying a foundation for how can I enjoy heaven if my loved one's in hell? I'm trying to lay a foundation so that it'll prepare us for what I want to say. Now, I want you to listen to me. Out of these two verses here in, Romans, or in Hebrews 12, I see a few things. Number one, God never speaks to a shallow Christian. God will not speak to a shallow Christian. Now, if that shallow Christian is really ready to repent and get down to business and say, Lord, I'm sorry for being insincere. I'm sorry, and so I'm going to now delve into the Scriptures. I'm now going to get on my knees and pray. I'm now going to lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset me. I'm going to run the race with patience that is set before me. Then He'll speak to your heart. This book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. Every Christian needs to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. What do you do when a Jehovah's false witness comes to your door? Are you ready for him? What do you do when the Mormon comes to your church? Are you ready for him? How would you answer them? 
the Jehovah's Witnesses will say, well, now Jesus is not the God, he's a God. Well, John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. They try to twist that around. And by the way, their New World Translation of the Bible, they say that the men that put that book together were all Hebrew and Greek scholars. Did you know not one of them is a Hebrew or Greek scholar? Check it out. And did you know they were founded by Charles Taz Russell back in the late 1900s? Huh? Study their history. Study it. Palmyra, New York. Sue and I were there for four years. We were four miles away from the Hill Cumora pageant. Four miles away for the, from the founder of Mormonism. I went down to the paper while we were living there, and I pulled out the records of this guy. He was hated in Palmyra, New York. He was despised. He was a liar. He was a horse thief. He ran all over the mountains up there trying to find treasure. And that's in the papers. And yet this religion is founded by him. Know the truth. The truth will set you free. Am I a shallow Christian? I'm not going to know the deep things of God. I'm not going to be able to understand about heaven unless I'm a kind of a Christian that's really willing to get in there. God doesn't speak to a shallow Christian. God doesn't speak to a self-defender. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I'm okay. And we start making excuses for why we don't go to church, why we're not faithful to church, why we don't tithe. Why we don't witness. Why we don't do this. Why we don't do that. And we make excuses. You know why we make excuses? Because we want to do what we want to do. We want to be comfortable. We want to be happy. We don't want nothing to upset us. Our routine. Aren't you glad that Jesus was willing to leave heaven and come to this earth and die for you? Aren't you glad of that? Will you be able, will I be able to thank Him after we're in heaven for five million years? Will you be able to really thank Him for dying for you? We'll never be able to thank Him enough. I don't have the words to say, but I ought to be faithful. And so He's not going to speak to me if I'm a shallow Christian. He's not going to speak to me if I'm a self-defender. And He's not going to speak to me if I'm one of these insincere individuals. Now, Religion with no reverence. Here are the things the devil will use. He'll use entertainment. Entertainment. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a good time. Nothing wrong with enjoying life. As a matter of fact, did you know the Bible says that the Lord has created this earth and has given us richly all things to enjoy? You say, well, Brother Boofer is saying we can't enjoy ourselves. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that if you're a Christian and that you're saved and you're right with God, you're the one that really enjoys life. You're the one that really enjoys serving God. But you have to watch the, out for the entertainment that can pull you away and pull you astray. Self-defense. You try to make yourself look good. You know, I'm just a wretched sinner. I'm no better than anybody. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I have to ask God to forgive me just like everybody else has to ask God to forgive them. I make my mistakes. I have my slip-ups uh, just like anybody else does. You have to watch out for the influence of the, weir, of the world, peer pressure. Young people, that's the thing that you're running into all the time at school is peer pressure. And they'll try to turn you away through all kinds of things. The influence of peer pressure. Social habits. Social habits. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. The devil will use all of those things. And then personal habits. The devil will use it. Personal habits to turn us away from our Lord. But he says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on the things of this earth. Now read on. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Did you get that? You'll appear with him in glory. Now let me say this. 
I hope that you don't want to just be there. You know, some Christians seem to have this idea, well, I'll just be satisfied with being there. There are five crowns that the New Testament says that a believer can win if they're faithful. And we'll be able to have those crowns and cast them at his feet after the judgment seat of Christ to show our love for him, our faithfulness toward him. Set our affection on things above, not on the things of this earth. Why? Because when he appears, we'll appear with him in glory. But now look at the next verse. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil consupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, watch this now. Verse 2 says, set your affection. Verse 5 says, mortify. The word mortify there means render helpless. Now watch. This body of mine, this body of yours, has desires. Why? Because we still have a carnal nature. We have a new nature, but we have a carnal nature. Those carnal na natures that we have are constantly pulling, aren't they? They're constantly pulling. Have you ever laid down at night and, and, and you said, I really want to pray. And you're praying, and all of a sudden, where in the world did that bad thought come from? Where in the world did that anger come from? The flesh and the devil. The devil has the power to put thoughts in your mind, and he'll use your flesh to throw thoughts into your mind. Did you know it's possible to sit in a church like this on Sunday morning, listening to the singing and preaching, and have people sit in a pew like that and look around the congregation and see somebody and have bad thoughts about them or mean thoughts about them? Isn't that a terrible thing? That's the flesh. Watch. Mortify, mortify, render useless, therefore, your members which are up on the earth. Look at this now. Fornication, uncleanliness, inordered affections, evil, consupiscence, and covetous, which is idolatry. Listen now. Please listen. And I'm going to close in just a moment, but please listen to me. Did you know that even though you're a Christian, and I'm a Christian, we are capable when we get out of walking in the Spirit, to commit any of these sins? You said, I'd, I'd never commit fornication. You better back up. You better back up. You say, well, I, I would never do any of these things. These are evil things, in order of affection. Here's a man that says he loves his wife, but he goes to work and he's got a, a gal there that he has affection for. That's possible for a Christian man to do that, a Christian woman to do that. The old devil's constantly working to drag you down and defeat you. Well, I don't like this about Journey of Baptist Church. I don't like this about the preaching. I don't like this about the singing. I don't like this. I don't like that. The devil loves that. The devil loves that because when we get to doing that, then we'll get our mind off of missions. We'll get our mind off of lost souls. We'll get our mind off of loving one another. Now let me stop right here and say this. As a member of Journey Baptist Church, do you really, do you really want to see people saved in this church? Do you really want to see it grow? Then how many people did you invite to church last week? Oh, preacher, you're getting mean now. Well... You say, well, now you can say that because, look, look, I've got my problems, you've got your problems. But I'm just simply saying, let's get ready so that we can get into the deeper things of God. Now, verse 6, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. God's justice grinds slow but it grinds sure. Be sure your sin will find you out. Put to death these things. Verse 7, In the which you also walked some time when you lived in them. And then watch this. Here's the key now. Listen to me. But now you also put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, 
filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Put off the old man, put on the new man. Just like taking off an old dirty coat or an old dirty piece of garment and putting on a new clean garment. Put off the old things, put on the new things so that we can be sincere and be real. Am I real? Am I real? Are you real? Let's stand with heads bowed and eyes closed. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Now our group's going to come and they're going to lead us in a song of invitation.